So hello everybody and welcome to the first in a three-part webinar series brought to you by Bisa Johannesburg. And my name is John Green and I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our panel of distinguished guests. We've got Ian Kirk, the Group Chief Executive of Sanlam, Nick Kelly, the Senior Market Advisor at Enterprise Ireland, and Rudy Bezadenhout, the Managing Director at Best Forex. Of course, I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining the call remotely. And I'll try and see um, by the chat who's actually on the call at the end, if we have a little bit of time to see, get a little bit of an idea who's actually dialed in. So I'd like to kick off with a brief introduction to BISA and the series before, before we get into some fascinating insights on the fight against the effects of COVID-19, which is undoubtedly being the most disruptive and devastating global crisis of the 21st century. We'll hear first from Ian Kirk, and then from Rudy Bezaitenhand, and finally from Nicola Kelly before I'll just wrap up the first episode. And this three-part series will tackle the response on the ground in South Africa, particularly from the business community, before we delve into the ways the private sector is going to act positively and effectively mobilize their resources in the face of a crisis. So that will be the second episode. Um, and lastly, how to plan for a post-pandemic environment between um, Ireland and South Africa. So I'm John Green. A lot of you know me, but um, hopefully we've got some new people joined in as well. Um, and I'm the chairman of BC Johannesburg. So we're a non-profit Irish business network and part of a wider group of business chapters spanning much of sub-Saharan Africa. I'm pleased to announce that we've recently formed a new and exciting committee and who are dedicated to bringing insightful and fruitful events to the Irish business community around Joburg. I'd like to thank our new committee for making this. Our first event happened at very short notice. And before, sorry, I'm just having a bit of an issue here. So, um, we've got, um, new panel of experts really on the committee. Um, in everything is gonna be updated. We're gonna see a lot of action. So please visit our LinkedIn page and sign up to the group as well. And also our website is uh, businessireland.coza. So you'll see lots of um, information about new events and who the committee are and who you need to contact. So 2020 promises to be a very active year for Visa. And hopefully once we emerge from this devastating crisis, we'll have the opportunity to bring some light to the business community in the face of such a challenging environment also, we're going to want to help make a posit some positive connections over the year, if we can actually connect outside of the virtual world, and then facilitate some awesome events for you, the members of BISA. So, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our first guest, Group CEO of Sandlam, a fellow dub and originally an accountant who left Ireland for South African shores in the early 1980s, and who's gone from small beginnings to reach the very pinnacle of the financial services industry at the helm of Sandlam. Please welcome Mr. Ian Kirk, and welcome back to BISA. Thank you, John. Thank you. And um, so, Ian, it was um, fantastic to see a familiar face on the news the other day when, we were, when they were discussing the direct action to confront the crisis head on. And um, would you be able to tell us a bit about your um, involvement in the 1 billion rand COVID-19 response assistance with uh, Patrice Motsepe? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a logical thing for us to do. You know, we've been around for 101 years. We've been successful. We've been successful out of the support that we've had from South Africans. So it just seemed logical for us to go back and do what we could. So we came with an amount, which is a substantial amount. And then in discussions with um, Patrice, who's obviously our deputy chairman, uh, he felt that, you know, we could raise through associate organizations, we could... Uh, we could extend what we were prepared and we, what we have, were capable of supporting and get up to a billion rands if we all worked together. And that was essentially, John, what we did. So we just thought, you know, that if we went together, you know, it would just be a, a more bigger impact. And to be honest with you, it's all about the money. You know, you can do a lot more with a billion than you can do with, say, a couple hundred million. And that was really the rationale there. And of course, Patrice, you know, who's had a very, very successful a business career and he has got a lot of influence. He knows that he's very, very committed to this thing. It really is a big, big thing. I mean, he spends hours and hours and hours every day on this issues. And we just thought it made sense, you know, to club together with all his, his associates and his, all his interests to do more. So what we're doing basically is providing the money and then the support 
through our foundation, through the capabilities that we've got to get the stuff done. For example, you know, there's an initial phase, which is to support people who are in the front line, because as you've seen and you've read, there's not enough uh, capability around there in terms of medical equipment and masks and sanitizers and all that kind of thing. So we'll put that money in at the moment. That's the first phase and then supporting vulnerable communities. And then we'll keep it going over the next uh, six to nine months, we would imagine, because this thing is with us for a while. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's such an amazing initiative. And I think um, having read a lot about it in all the different areas, you're actually getting huge scale. And even in, in world terms, the one billion rands is like it's massive. It's, it's one of the biggest I've, I've read about in the world. And it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any, uh, would you able to tell us a little bit about some of the, the interventions where it's actually going? A little bit more, maybe? Yeah, well, as I said, that Patrice is really driving it. Most of our funding at this stage has gone into the testing equipment because, as you know, John, that's the big issue that we face. I think South Africa is dealing with this, this crisis pretty well, but the, the competence of how we deal with it is impacted largely by the extent of the testing. And I think we'd all agree we need to do more testing, which means we need more more, more equipment. So having put in place the, you know, the funding to provide... Uh, the medical equipment to the front line, we're now working very, very hard at the testing. That's really the issue where most of the money is going at the moment. But, you know, we're working on a coordinated basis. Patrice is really driving this thing and it's, it's very exciting to work with him. I, I speak to him every day and he's just passionate about, about this thing. Wow, that's fantastic. And uh, congratulations on that. It's really making such a big impact. And I'm sure it's, it's one of the big factors driving the low uh, rates that we're seeing in South Africa compared to some of the, the other countries that we're being inundated with information on. So um, during this crisis then, as, as um, you know, everybody's have to find new ways of working. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about how you've been leading Sandlam through this crisis? Well, you know, <laughs> as you can see from my grey hair, I've been around for a while. I've been through a few of these events, but really, and you said it in the introduction so well, this is very different. And the real problem with this one is you just don't know where we are. We just, we think we can have the information, but you know, each day is, is different. So, you know, you, you are really tested as a leader in, in this thing, but I'm very fortunate in that, you know, Salem is a very strong company and I've got great support. So obviously, you know, you, you deal and you lead from the front and you, you take the opportunity and people expect you to lead. And, you know, so I'm very happy to do that with the support that I get. But you, so you, you, do, you deal with different things. For example, you know, I would have spent 25% of my time dealing with industry issues and dealing with government and dealing with business associations. Because Sanlam, as you've said, is a, is a significant player in the country. Now that 25%, I can tell you now, is 50% because we have to work together. So the role that we have to play as business leaders, and I'll make the point, I'm not on my own. I mean, the business leaders are really coming to the party as, as, uh, as, as is government, as is everybody. So I'm spending about 50% of my time on business association stuff, industry stuff, dealing with government, coming with proposals. Um, you know, we input proposals as early as for the cabinet meeting yesterday on fiscal stimulus package, how we must deal with this lockdown. Can we do it on a risk adjusted basis? And those things are very, very important because it's a position that I can, as the leader of Sunlam, I can have some influence on that. And of course, because I've worked on that in the past, I'm in a position, I know the people, I know how to get the stuff done. Then on internally, what you're really trying to do is, is deal with your key stakeholders and, and communicating and communicating and communicating. And that's why, you know, with opportunities like this, the more we can speak about this thing and work together to deal with this crisis, the better. So I spend a heck of a lot of time communicating. I have to do it differently. You know, because we're an essential service, we are able to go to the office, not all of us, because there are conditions which we've been uh, provided. With. So 87% of our people are now working from home. 13% are working in the office. I work, you know, one day in the office and I'm, today I'm at home. As you can see, I'm not in the office. So the, the way that you do it is very different. You communicate. I communicate very frequently now with our people. They expect to be 
you know, the leader to show sympathy, to show empathy, to tell them what they what we're about. And and when 87% of them are remotely, you know, you can't call them in for a town hall like you might do normally. So it's all on these electronic media, which is the best we can do. And it seems to work pretty well. I spend a lot of time with my colleagues. Uh, I spend a lot of time communicating to the market, to our international shareholders, to our local shareholders. And then, um, so I, I think it's, it's really leading from the front and it's thinking about stuff all the time. So, you know, it, it's, it's actually very, very different, the work that you do. Um, it, it's really on a daily basis quite different. It's 24 hours a day, you know, it's weekends and it's everything because this thing is all encompassing. And you, you're there and you have to, you are the leader. People expect you to stand up and lead and, and that's what you have to do. That's brilliant. Yeah, it sounds like you're really embracing this 21st century leadership via, via remotely and seems like it's working really well. And I've, I've seen a lot of positivity coming out of the leaders in the financial industry in South Africa, which is, which is brilliant. And a lot of collaboration as well, which was kind of never really seen before. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic to see. And I think the, hopefully South Africa is getting the credit globally that um, for the efforts you're actually putting in and the communities coming together, especially in financial services, what I've seen. So it's absolutely fantastic. Um, so just how do you think then that the COVID-19 will affect Sanlam directly? And um, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I mean, it's obviously a very big thing. But thankfully, and we're very fortunate, I'm very fortunate to be in a business like Sunlum. And let me explain that Sunlum is, we sort of structured the business to withstand three economic shocks. Um, now, what we've experienced in, up to now, John, is one economic shock. And we actually came to the market very early, about you know, well, two weeks ago, we came to the market and we explained to the market how we set up the company and how we are, what the financial impact of this has been. And, uh, you know, we, as you'd, you would expect a leading company to be strong through this, um, we are strong and, and we're very fortunate to be in that situation. But there are many things to keep an eye on. You have to watch the markets. You have to watch um, your operational capability. And that is the thing, I think, once you know that you're strong and you can withstand this, you need to work on what is, what is the impact operationally. Now, the first thing we had to do was to get included as an essential service. Had we not been included as essential service, life would have been much more difficult. So our regulator, I think, is very responsible and he gave us that approval. But then he said, you know, for example, 80 odd percent of your people must not be in the office. Things have got to change. It can't be business as usual. So the operational impact is really what we've um, had to spend time on. And our, our, we have over 200 businesses in 44 countries, if you can imagine. Uh, trying to keep all that together in times like this. And each one is different. You know, the lockdown provisions are different in India to what they are in South Africa, what they're different in Morocco, Eastern Africa. So you've got to deal with all those things. But I'm happy to say that our, our business continuity plans, they've been really tested and things are, are going pretty well. And then it's a case really of, of, of getting through this and, and, and seeing the opportunity. You know, you mentioned it earlier in your introduction. This is a process. We don't know how it's going to end up, but we, we're already, at, even at this stage, looking at opportunities. How will we do things differently not in the short term? And then, obviously, as we come through this phase, what will it mean for our business in the medium to long term? We're already giving thought to that. And, of course, because I've got great people around me, I can focus on running the business and they can focus on thinking about what does it mean for products? What does it mean for distribution? What does it mean for the way we work? Digital. I mean, we have a many, many digital projects, as you'd imagine, in Sanlam, but they will get a massive, massive impact now. The way we distribute products, the way we deal with our, our clients is going to be so different into the future. And I think it's very exciting, the type of people we employ, the way we work. You know, 87% of our people are not in the office. It makes you think, you know, what do you need these big offices anymore? And, you know, what's the most efficient way to do it? And, you know, the way we sell traditionally face-to-face -face distribution, how we're using the new tools that are available. So it's unfortunate that we're in this situation. We wish it were otherwise, but we will get through this working together and working smart. And I think there'll be a lot of positives um, when we do get through this. For those companies, you know, not, not everyone will survive, but that's a very sad thing. 
but I'm happy to say Sunlan will survive and we'll we'll get through this and we'll you know we'll be a better business I think and our industry will be better um, at the That's end great. of it. Yeah, so it sounds like you're well prepared for eventualities. So obviously, this was completely unprecedented, but um, you've done a great job with preparing your business, preparing the people, the business continuity sounds excellent. And I think that's going to speak to then where is it going to go post pandemic and who's going to be agile. So, um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, who's going, to, uh, who's going to survive this is going to be the ones that are the most agile and most prepared. So that's brilliant news to hear that um, you really embraced it and not panicking, obviously. So Ian, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Um, it's amazing to have you here during this pandemic and while you're um, navigating the, the crisis. So best of luck for the rest of it. And um, thank you so much for supporting Visa. And hopefully we'll see you again at a Visa event in the near future. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for arranging this. Good luck, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce Rudy Bezeitenhout. He's a new committee member at Visa Johannesburg, and he's a managing director at Best Forex. They're experts in foreign exchange and solutions, particularly for the import and export markets. So Rudy, if you're there, um, so I haven't seen your video yet, can you please tell us a bit more about the market impact of COVID-19 from your Forex perspective? Hello, Johnny. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'd uh, like to share a couple of slides with, with uh, the group in, uh, in explaining where we are and, and, and what we're doing. So um, in Best Forex, we try to create a competitive advantage for international clients, international payment uh, client supplies in South Africa. But uh, from a global trade and FX standpoint, I'd like to share following information regarding the monetary policy with, um, with everyone. We've seen on Tuesday, the Reserve Bank has cut the interest rates by one, one percentage point for the second time in, in less than a month. And the repo rate has now gone to 4.25% and the time rate sits at 7.75%. This is historically low and unprecedented times. Why these rate cuts? The move comes amid a wave of cuts by global central banks in an attempt to settle the economic damage of the COVID-19 epidemic. It also follows an announcement by Cyril Ramaphosa uh, on Thursday that South Africa um, South Africa's 21-day lockdown has been extended until the end of April. In the depth of these um, impending recession is likely worrying by the central bank. And the government will undoubtedly have to do more to support households and companies facing dramatic loss of income. Alongside most other central banks in this regard, the Reserve Bank has also opted to respond forcefully. The Reserve Bank will probably need to do more with a clear risk of being the impact on growth, underestimating the recovery as more sluggish. The monetary policy will have to do more of the heavy lifting that will come in the form of more rate cuts, more bond buying and more liquidity provision. On the other scale, um, what has happened to South African experience in the FX market in the last month? And I'd like to take everyone through the different time factors, what the RAND's reaction was in recent events. On Sunday, the 15th of March, the starting point of the chart, the RAND was trading at 18 RAND, 7 cents to the euro. That following Monday, the initial lockdown was announced and the market thinks a good move as currency trades sideways and even appreciates and as, new, as news of Wuhan, residents are going free, resonates. That Thursday, the 26th of March, reality was setting in and local importers quickly paid their invoices in case the work from home uh, was not viable. Monday, 6 April at 4.40 SA time, the all-time highs the rand struck at 20 rand at 90, 89 cents to the euro. That thinned the markets with minimal liquidity and a new week of opening trade for the Far East. The world has awakened to a revised growth forecast and that has now touted the worst since the late Great Depression. Therefore, the Great Lockdown Depression is now underway. Thursday, the 14th of April, due to the unexpected basis point cut by the Reserve Bank, the rand loses ground. 
in this unfortunate um, surprise of announcements during uh, trading hours, the RAND has moved 2.4% in minutes. With that said, SA bonds will still be attracting some foreign investors seeking to take advantage of good yields and attractive discount. From a South African exporter's point of view, South Africa has recorded the biggest trade surplus in 14 months in April as exports to Europe surged. The trade balance swung to a surplus of 14.15 billion rand to a revised deficit of 2.72 billion rand in January. The key insights we can take from this is that trade with Asia fell most of all regions in February as imports from the area declined by 6.2% and the exports dropped by 10.1%. South Africa's total exports increased 8.6% in the month to 109.6 billion rand as shipments to Europe rose by 28.3%. So there is still a strong argument to be made for exporters to use any currency upward spike to sell the currency. With this trade surplus, it could help narrow the shortfall on South Africa's current account and provide some support for the weakening rand. I read an article from an international monetary fund last night. South Africa is resilient enough to overcome the impact of coronavirus pandemic as long as its policies are recalibrated towards economic growth once the crisis has passed. The country's biggest strength is that it has very deep and liquid domestic capital markets relative to most other emerging market countries and generates the most of its financing domestically and in rands. We urge companies with international trade determine risk appetite to identify and measure exposures current and future, to establish a view on the market exchange rates and volatilities, and to monitor exposures and hedges on a regular basis. Thank you, Johnny. Great, Rudy. Thanks very much. Um, it's been unbelievable shock to the market across the world and Hopefully, like you've um, indicated there, we're going to see some a little bit of upside, at least for the to South, Af South African exporters. Um, but I think um, it's a strong economy here. There's a lot of people here, I mean, to be able to deal with it properly. So hopefully, you know, we're going to get some upside out of this, even in the, the market turmoil and the downgrade and everything. Um, so that brings us nicely from the import-export perspective into um, our last speaker. and. Nicola Kelly, I'd like to introduce you as the Senior Market Advisor at Enterprise Ireland and another new committee member for Visa Johannesburg. Enterprise Ireland is an Irish government organisation responsible for the development and growth of Irish enterprises worldwide and no doubt heavily impacted by COVID-19. So Nicola, if you're there, um, could you just tell, tell us a little bit about how you guys at Enterprise Ireland are communicating with your companies on how best to respond to the crisis? Thanks, Johnny. Um, let me just share a couple of slides. Um, yeah, so as Johnny mentioned, I'm a senior market advisor with Enterprise Ireland based in Johannesburg. Um, we, our main African base is located in Johannesburg and we are supported by trade representatives in Lagos and in Nairobi. And just to give you a bit more background, um, we support over 400 Irish exporters to Africa across all sectors. Um, and we're currently working with our clients to ensure that they can sustain their presence and their customers across the African continent. Um, Pre-pandemic, um, exports to Africa, um, as well as client interest in the region, um, had been increasing substantially year on year. So the current crisis, it's completely unprecedented. Um, Ireland's an extremely open economy, very dependent on exports. So this has created severe challenges for Irish business. Um, there's been significant job losses at home and worldwide disruption and a very uncertain road ahead. <clears throat> but now, so there is an awful lot that business can't really predict in the current environment. But as a business community, we need to focus on what we can control. So our advice to our client companies at the moment is to focus on just that. So stabilize, reset, and prepare for the recovery. 
In terms of stabilizing, and this is kind of where we're at in South Africa, there's been a very sudden shift, obviously, to remote working, and that's accelerated the need for companies to digitally transform. So this is um, a deadline that nobody really saw coming. Um, companies have had to implement remote working infrastructure and security um, to enable some form of business continuity. And so, as Ian um, spoke of earlier, aside from the IT challenges, businesses have to find ways to connect with their staff. So paying attention to that communication, productivity, employee well-being, um, because for some people working remotely is incredibly isolating. Um, and you know, your employees are a very essential component to your recovery. Um, so boosting team morale at this very strange time is very important. Um, also connecting with your existing customers is crucial. Contacting your client base, um, recognizing that it's not just a challenging time for you, but also for your customers and your supply partners as well. Um, and as we all know, retaining customers is much easier and much cheaper than finding new ones. So for companies to demonstrate commitment to clients now and appreciate their individual concerns um, should, should pay off in customer loyalty. Um, and particularly for Irish companies with local partners here in South Africa, connect and communicate with them. Discuss the situation on the ground. Um, this is, you know, obviously a global issue, but see what's happening in South Africa. See if there's any collaboration that um, you can develop kind of specific solutions that can be easily deployed at the moment. In terms of reset, um, there's no doubt that COVID-19 is going to have immediate and long-term business impacts. Um, and again, as Ian mentioned, you know, working on that operational resilience is key to alleviating some of those impacts on your business, your workforce, supply chain, and your customers. And I think um, the shock of this pandemic um, has really provided a very clear understanding on supply chains, you know, where our components and our parts are actually coming from. Um, and there's lots of uh, learnings that have come from this event. Um, and these learnings should kind of be hard and to provide resilience to any kind of future black swan events, as this is being referred to. Um, and even though businesses around the world are dealing with um, immediate implications of national shutdowns, now is really the time to invest in the future of your company. So, you know, accelerate the digitization of your business. Take the time to upskill your employees ahead of the rebound. Um, the crisis will end um, and you need to be getting ready for that. So it's about preparing now so you're not losing out now and then again in the future. Because some of the changes um, that this crisis about will be permanent. Um, so really take a look at your industry, take a look at your buyer behavior, um, and reset your business and your business model to make sure that you're still relevant um, and still um, ready for the recovery. And that recovery will come. Um, everything can seem quite overwhelming at the moment and South Africa is some way behind other nations in the pandemic timeline. But there is some semblance of normality returning in Asia and parts of Europe. Um, so that's definitely something to take heart in. Um, there's no doubt that certain sectors have been more adversely affected by the pandemic, aviation, the tourism, hospitality, um, but there are others like healthcare, digital technology. These sectors are going to be a much quicker road to recovery given the nature of this crisis. Um, for example, after the pandemic, it's almost certain that international stockpiles of equipment will grow. Um, there'll be investment into indigenous manufacturing capability in medical devices and equipment. Um, and there will be a, a heightened focus on hygiene and, and sanitization even post-pandemic. So I think what's key for all businesses, um, no matter where you're located, is check what supports are available to you now. Um, because measures have been placed all around the world to help businesses to stabilize and, and adapt to this very rapidly evolving situation in preparation for getting back on the road to recovery. Um, for Irish companies, the Irish government has rolled out a very comprehensive package um, of support schemes for individuals and for business. And we've developed a COVID-19 business response plan. And you can see there's a link there that you can download that from our website. 
There's loads of information there on um, the supports that are available, but also there's lots of information on best practice, you know, when it comes to people management, business processes and operations, supply chain management, communication. So even if you're not an Irish company, it's definitely worth having a look at that anyway. I'm going to stop now, um, but my contact details are here on the screen, or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And I'm going to hand over to John. Great, thank you, Nicola. I think um, that's great to hear that kind of support for SMEs, which are undoubtedly going to be some of the hardest hit um, after this crisis, because they don't have the luxury of having made provisions and um, not necessarily all of them are going to have investors who are going to be able to help them through this and having that kind of steady knowledgeable hand there in EI must be absolutely crucial for some of those some of your clients so that's great to hear that um, you're providing that um, yeah, level headed. and I think you know it's it's also in South Africa there's a very comprehensive package of support so it's about investigating what's there because you know, it, it is the time for, for government to step in and support some of the worst affected sectors um, to get through this crisis. Um, but, you know, there are green shoots and it's all about planning for recovery and making sure that your business model is sustainable. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think that brings it nicely to a close and to follow up for our next webinar. So I'd just like to thank you, Nicola, and thank our other panel members, Rudy Bezaitenhout and Ian Kirk. Um, I really hope everyone enjoyed our first webinar and our next installment um, in, the, in the series is going to be next week, hopefully. And we're going to discuss um, in more detail ways the private sector can act positively to mobilize their resources in the face of the crisis. So like we were saying with Nicola there, um, we're going to go over in a little bit more detail what can they really do to help the crisis and help themselves as well at the same time. Um, we've got some really exciting speakers for you coming up in the next two series. So we're going to distribute some information as well following this call to answer some of your questions that you submitted as best we can, some of our contact details and also our, um, the slides that uh, Rudy and Nicola has shared. So please keep your eye on the BISA social media where we're going to reveal our lineup of new panelists soon and a little bit more detail again on um, what we're actually going to be talking to. So I'd just like to, we've gone a little bit over time, but um, thank you everybody for watching and thank you for our panelists again. And everybody, um, I hope you stay safe and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you very much.